Paul, the stage is yours. Whoa. Yes. Okay. Awesome, guys. Um, so this is a really cool panel in that um, I mean, we've been talking about tech ecosystems and countries that are on the rise. So one of the countries has actually really done a great job of kind of starting from a really small place to becoming kind of one of the hubs of the world is Finland. And um, I've actually been pretty lucky to kind of watch this grow for almost 20 years through some of my relations with these guys. In the last five or six years, it's really blown up. And um, I've been actually putting a lot of personal bets there. I think I've done 18 or 19 investments into the country of Finland alone, which is a pretty huge amount for a Silicon Valley-based investor. Um, but yeah, so I have two guests here. These guys, I would say, I would consider them kind of some of the godfathers of the tech industry there, both in gaming, but just in general, all across the board. They've been there from the beginning. They've been supporting entrepreneurs, both investing and advising. And these guys really could teach you guys a lot about what it takes to build an ecosystem, how to have, you know, bring the people together, how to kind of have it start from the grassroots, but also top down. Um, so our first speaker is going to be a guy named Vili Miettinen. I've known him probably since 1996 or 95 or something like that. And we both got to know each other because we had a very common passion around computer graphics, video games, and kind of this whole industry. Um, it actually attracts a lot of talent. Actually, one of the things Finland's really well known for. Um, so Vili will first talk about uh, that kind of building up and how the gaming industry started in Finland. and kind of also has promoted the, the Finnish tech ecosystem from there. And Morfox is going to follow him and give a presentation on kind of how the tech ecosystem has really boomed in the last five, six years, how the grassroots has kind of really picked up and, um, you know, really gone from there. And Mofak also, like I said, one of the godfathers, he also was rated the, the angel of year this year in Finland. So he's been doing a lot of big service. So, uh, yeah, please give a hand for these guys. And Vili, you're first. Hey. We'll do a Q&A afterwards. You can ask tons of questions. So, yes. So is my mic working? Yeah, apparently, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, I'll talk a bit about the birth of the gaming industry in Finland, but I'll start with my favorite subject, aka me. Uh, so, uh, that's, uh, so my name is William Miettinen. I am a serial entrepreneur, an angel investor, and a professional adventurer. Uh, I uh, live in Helsinki. I'm a Finn, uh, but I was born in Geneva and spent my childhood in the Silicon Valley. And on most years, I travel about 200 days a year. Uh, all over the world, and I've always wanted to come to Beirut. So when Paul uh, sent me an email and said there might be an opportunity, uh, I took it because I wanted to celebrate something, because Lebanon became my country number 100 that I've visited. So we've been celebrating that every night here. Uh, I'm also a programmer, uh, as you can guess, a, a geek like me. Uh, I've been coding since the ripe age of seven. Uh, and started professionally doing that. Uh, I essentially became a male prostitute uh, at the age of 16. Uh, by that I mean that I started coding for money, which is filthy. And I founded my very first company in, when I was 19, and uh, for the next 22 years, which I guess ages, tells my age, uh, uh, I've been building a, a number of uh, technology companies mostly in the area of 3D computer graphics uh, and then some gaming uh, related companies. Uh, one bigger exit, uh, we sold uh, our company Hybrid Graphics to NVIDIA, uh, the world's biggest uh, graphics chip manufacturer, is these days known as NVIDIA Finland, um, employs about a hundred people there. Uh, and then I've got a couple of other Silicon Valley exits to Intel and Google and I'm right now in the process of trying to exit my current company. But uh, let's talk a bit about the birth of the gaming industry in Finland. Uh, and for that, we have to go back to the... Uh, well, the actual birth was in the early 90s, so 93, 94, roughly. But in order to understand why it was... We have to go way uh, back in time uh, to my childhood. Uh, and my teen years, because as teenagers, uh, we didn't have too much money, uh, so we couldn't afford to buy computer games. So we pirated them, uh, of course. And uh, the publishers, uh, games publishers, realized pretty quickly that they're losing a lot of money because teenagers are uh, pirating the games, and they. No, is this mic working at all? Okay, so, uh, so we started pirating, uh, pirating games. The publishers realized they were losing money, so they started to add copy protection layers to their games, 
we started cracking the copy protections, they added better ones, we cracked them, and we started adding these little digital signatures, digital graffiti, basically. So if very hypothetically speaking, I would have cracked a game and committed, committed uh, a crime, I would have added a little tiny text saying, cracked by Willy. And then someone realized, uh, like to the title screen of the game, and then someone realized that wouldn't it be more fun if there just wouldn't be a little text, but maybe a little graphical effect to make the cracked by Willy make me bounce a bit or make it um, run on a sine wave or something like that. And then people started upping the ante and creating more and more uh, gra graphical effects, then started adding soundtracks to those, and then these little crack throws eventually uh, uh, turned out into an art form uh, known as demos. And these are like full length, four or five, even 10 minute, uh, non-interactive um, art pieces containing like a full soundtrack, and they were demonstrating what are the limits uh, of what you can actually do uh, on, a, on a, initially like a Commodore 64, Amiga, then later on PCs. And this grew into a huge phenomenon in Northern Europe. Uh, in Finland, it was massive. Sweden, Denmark, um, Germany, Holland. It was very little, in, uh, very small in America. So very much of a Nordic phenomenon. And there were like tens or hundreds of thousands <laughs> of enthusiasts creating these demos in the 80s and early 90s. And the important thing here is that the people who were creating the demos, they were organized into groups, which are called demo groups. And a demo group needs at least one brilliant programmer, one really talented uh, graphics artist, and, and a skilled musician. That's the bare minimum. And uh, the demo groups competed heavily. So even today we have these huge events like Assembly in Helsinki where 10,000 people come and compete in de demos and watch them and vote on them. And winning a demo competition uh, is extremely important. Uh, so, so the groups were ultra compet uh, competitive, but at the same time there was this very strong ideology that all ideas uh, must be shared. Information must be free. So if I would create a particular 3D graphics routine the first time in the world, and people would go like, whoa, how did he do it? And I, I would use that information to win a demo competition to get the fame, but then immediately afterwards, I would tell people how I did it so that the, uh, the community itself was uh, evolving extremely rapidly. Now, let's go forward to the early 90s. Uh, we grew up. Uh, became uh, responsible adults, or less than responsible, and uh, we thought that it would be really nice to do computer graphics uh, as a living. And in Finland at that time, it was impossible to study graphics. Uh, there were no companies for that. There was no startup scene, no VCs, no angel investors, not even the beginning of a startup uh, community. So the only option we really had was to start companies ourselves. Uh, and become entrepreneurs, even though we didn't re quite realize that there's something like business involved there. So we were doing it purely for fun and in order to show uh, or basically measure our, the length of our penises. And uh, the demo groups themselves evolved into companies. So every single games company in Finland, every single graphics technology company in Finland from the early 90s, was a demo team, a demo group. And uh, in the beginning, I, when I started out, I think where there were less than like 10 people uh, professionally doing anything in this field. The gaming community, um, the game studio community has now grown. Uh, this year we have 2,500 people making a living out of making games. We have 300 studios where Paul has probably invested into all the best ones. 15, yeah, uh, and 15. we're uh, making about, I guess, about $2 billion a year uh, in revenue. So it's become uh, quite crazy. The most successful one of those uh, is a company called Supercell, which was founded only like well, four years ago. Uh, they are responsible for over a billion dollars uh, of the $2 billion revenues. 
And interestingly enough, I mean, they, they haven't moved their company to Luxembourg or Malta or some other place, so they are the model taxpayers in Finland. And Supercell, a company of 150 people, paid 20% of all of Helsinki's taxes, corporate taxes. Considering that we have like big uh, international companies uh, uh, in town, so it's uh, uh, ridiculous. So the gaming scene is doing really well, and most importantly, uh, the spirit that we started out with, the, the idea of having a community and sharing ideas, that still very much exists, and that's a fundamental part of the culture. So our local IGDA chapter, so the, the international uh, Game Developers Association chapter, I think it's the world's second or most active. At a typical meeting, every month we meet in a pub, we drink beer, and uh, we swap ideas. We have usually about 400 people attending from 50 to 100 studios. And uh, when foreign visitors come over, they just cannot believe that something like this is happening. Even so close as Sweden, the neighboring country, there, the CEOs of the game studios tell their developers that you are not allowed to go to any IGDA meetings because some other company will try to poach you. Uh, so they don't have this communal activity, whereas we do. And then when the rest of the startup industry really got going in maybe 2007 onwards, and I think Moafak is going to, in a moment, tell about that, they inherited a lot of these values from the demo scene and the gaming community, uh, and uh, the whole Helsinki startup ecosystem is extremely open, uh, extremely friendly. If you come to town, you get to meet absolutely, like just drop me an email or tweet me, you'll get to meet anyone you want there, any investor, any CEO of a startup, they'll be happy to drink tons of beer with you. So this is, this is what's amazing about this is that this is the concept of oversharing, right? So right now we have a room that's very powerful. Everybody here could go out there and start a huge ecosystem, be it in, in Lebanon or in their own respective countries. I mean, Finland was only like, you know, five to ten people that started like this and it stepped, you know, started growing. So if you guys want to help your own way, don't wait for the government, don't wait for other people to tell you what to do. Just start building, start sharing, and start including people. And from there we'll kind of go. So, Mofak, I think you should kind of take it to the next level where the, the game industry kind of shifted into the whole industry in general. All right, thank you. So I think, do we have the slides? Out of few. Well, all right, so um, I'm gonna talk about uh, creating a startup uh, ecosystem from scratch. Uh, and uh, so case study Finland. And I'm pretty much starting from where Willie left. Uh, and I, first to start with my background, I'm a serial entrepreneur turned angel investor and VC nowadays. So I started my first company, I think when I was 20, and uh, I've never, I've always created my own job, never applied for one. And um, the, the company we founded, or my previous company, was a company called Tremor. Uh, it's called Wall Street Systems today. So we founded that in the early 90s, which was the, the biggest and greatest depression or, uh, and recession in the history of the country. Uh, and we were doing financial software. We're targeting the biggest banks in the world. Uh, the first year or two, we weren't too successful in that endeavor. But we got a few customers in Sweden, actually. Uh, we, were uh, we ended up first serving the multinational corporates, so Fortune 500 like ABB, and uh, later on a couple of others. Uh, I, I spent quite a few years, 12 years there, actually. As one of the co-founders, I was involved in marketing, but lots of other things as well. Uh, first in Sweden, uh, Finland, Sweden, France, US, came back to Europe. Uh, we sold the company in 2004. Um, at that time, we had customers like uh, Citibank, uh, G GE, General Electric, European Central Bank, and many others, mostly high-end corporates and uh, the largest financial institutions in the world. So I, I took some time off after that uh, sabbatical and came back to Finland and, uh, and started investing, first my own capital, uh, and then recently I've, uh, I've formed two investment companies or funds. One is called Superhero Capital, which is investing in B2B software companies, and then CISO Game Ventures with Paul and another guy called Samuli Suvahuoko, who is the, the father of the Finnish gaming industry in a way. 
So we're investing in gaming, virtual reality, and, and lots of other interesting companies. We have 16 investments at the moment, and uh, we're looking to make a few others probably uh, soon. But what I'd like to really talk about is, is I came back to Finland after, I think it was like 14, 15 years spending abroad, and this was 2007. Uh, here's some background information about Finland. Uh, so it's 5.5 uh, million people. Uh, it used to be a very poor agrarian country. Uh, in the Second World War, we came second, so we lost, uh, which actually meant that we had to pay a huge debt to Soviet Union, which interestingly actually catalyzed a big part of the heavy industry we have now. So many of the machinery and, and kind of heavy industry had to be started from scratch to pay the war debt. Interestingly, Finland is apparently the only country in the world that has ever paid all its war debt. So that created lots of interesting companies, but mostly in kind of big companies or mini conglomerates, if you will. Um, and you probably didn't know this, uh, but when I or we guys were growing up, uh, 70s and 80s, Nokia was doing rubber boots and toilet paper. These are actual Nokia products. Um, then came the mobile uh, phone boom, uh, and Nokia kind of took off globally. It's a very interesting story for Finland, but it didn't really create many startups. Some ecosystem, obviously, around Nokia, serving the mobile phone industry, uh, mostly in the hardware space, not that much software. And then iPhone came, the mobile bust uh, from, from Finland's point of view. Nokia no longer, although it's a very successful company, it's not really the company we knew and, and grew up with. And um, so what happened then is uh, uh, when I came back to Finland in 2007, 2008 there, uh, this was before the financial crisis and before this bust, uh, all the smartest kids, like the students, wanted to study, they were studying engineering, business, what have you, but they wanted to end up in, in consulting, banking, or work for a large corporate. And this was kind of the, the dream job, one of these. Uh, and then the financial crisis happened, and uh, some of these kids started asking, so why, do, why should I do 80 hours in an office doing PowerPoints for someone else when I could do something meaningful for myself. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to my friend Christo Ovaska. He's a business, I think you can safely say that he's a, he's a dropout. He's probably never going to graduate. He's a business school student from the, sorry? Yeah, he's a dropout as well. Anyway, so uh, Christo was studying business at Aalto University, which is a Finnish university. Uh, which unites the design, engineering, and business schools in one holistic university. And he, he was, I think he was at MIT and some other universities in the US uh, looking at what they are doing and, and how they are handling entrepreneurships and startups and so on. And he got together with some, some of his fellow students uh, and they decided to start something called Alto Entrepreneurship Society. Uh, first it was just a a couple of students doing informal gatherings. Uh, but the interesting thing, kind of a collision that we managed, or like serendipity in a way, was that while they started this uh, society, we, uh, there was a kind of a diaspora uh, of us. So Finns who had spent considerable time abroad came back to Finland after selling their companies. Willie had said he, sent, sold his company some people had sold their companies to, to Google or something, and then they came back. And, and this happened at the same time when he was creating his uh, entrepreneur thing for the students. So we started arranging these meetups, uh, or they, they, the students arranged, but we came there, and uh, we were speaking, we were mentoring. So a lot of pro bono happening. Uh, the old farts and the, the young enthusiastic students meeting and colliding. And what today we have is, first of all, the largest student-run stud uh, entrepreneurship initiative in Europe, possibly in the world. Uh, they're arranging 100 events per year. They have the, just recently they had the Euro uh, Europe's 
largest hackathon with coders from 31 countries. Uh, they have a program called uh, Startup Life, which takes uh, hundreds of interns from Finland and sends them to companies in Silicon Valley. Sometimes they also do it the other way around, so Silicon Valley interns coming to Finland. And uh, I think one thing I actually didn't mention was that at the same time that this was happening in the grassroots, uh, a friend of mine made a research, uh, whoops, Sorry. <laughs> analyzing the, the Finnish system because the government had been channeling tons and tons, billions of euros into the ecosystem in terms of uh, R&D loans, grants, all kinds of subsidies and programs, initiatives, and what have you. Uh, so a friend of mine made this research comparing three ecosystems, Israel, uh, Massachusetts, and Finland, which are about the same size in, in many parameters. The inputs to the system, the innovation system, were alike, but comparable. The outputs were miserable in Finland compared to what Israel or Massachusetts has been achieving in terms of uh, how many companies IPO'd, or, IPO'd or, or NASDAQ, how much VC money raised, and so on. So the, the official, the governmental side was not happening. The grassroots was. The, the other thing, what was kind of a spin-off from Alta Entrepreneurship Society was start, Startup Sauna, which has started in 2010. Uh, and it's been running now two batches a year. It's an accelerator. It's a non-profit accelerator. So we don't uh, take any equity. And it's, it's purely 100% pro bono. So people like me, Willie, a whole bunch of others come there, mentor the people, the teams, and uh, hopefully uh, also help uh, building successful companies, or at least initiating them. We actually have some startup sound and alumni here. Yes, Priscilla. Um, so we've run these events now for quite a while. And uh, we are seeing a lot of our startups, uh, not just from Finland, but from elsewhere, applying, participating in the program. Some of them are actually incorporating in Finland. They decide to stay there. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, de development. It's everything started from the student-run initiative. And finally, uh, we have, I don't know how well the text shows there, but we have Slush, which is the biggest startup conference in Northern Europe. Perhaps this, the biggest in Europe, if you don't compare Web Summit, because Web Summit is a bit more than just startups nowadays. So this started a few years ago. It was first 200 people in one room, well, smaller than this. Now it's 15,000 delegates from 100 countries, and uh, we had 800 investors, 1,700 startups from, from all over the world. And I think the kind of the, what I'd like to end this presentation with is a couple of slides. Firstly, going back to this Christo, uh, who started this whole thing, uh, or he's one of the main catalysts there. He created a company called FunRank, which was a stupid idea, never took off. But it, and it failed. Uh, he created a company called Metrify. The idea was great, but it never took off. Now he has a company called Smartly, which is one of the fastest growing B2B software companies in Europe. Uh, so it's, it's all about, uh, I think you can summarize it here. So it's about failing fast, failing small. Uh, the other learning that we've had from this uh, in Finland is that crises can actually create opportunities uh, it takes time. It takes a long time to build an ecosystem. I think we've now experienced this for it's seven years and still running and, and developing. Uh, one thing I think for Lebanon would be interesting, uh, you probably do that already, but what we notice in Finland works very well, is to lure back your diaspora. So the, the people have been working in Silicon Valley or Asia or wherever, come back. They don't have to move back, but at least spend some time there and really help. Uh, catalyze the, the ecosystem. Pro bono plus investors uh, and less consultants, that's very important. And uh, finally, money is not the answer to everything. Money is a fuel, but just like in a startup, you need to get your product market fit first, uh, really 
crystallize before you can pour the fuel into it. Otherwise, you're just wasting money. And my biggest learning from this whole thing is that early stage investing is not about investing or less about invest. It's not a banker's job. It's about business development and building companies. Thank you, Mofog. So, I mean, what we could see here, though, and I think a lot of takeaway could be taken to, yeah, be it Lebanon or any country in the world. There's two major things here. One, super grassroots. They didn't wait for anybody. There were no excuses. Like, a lot of times I'm here, and actually the last couple of days I'm here, people saying, oh, it's not big enough. We don't have enough, you know, resources. We don't have enough money. You know what? That's bullshit. Like, these guys have proven time and time again that they actually started this ecosystem that was in the crisis, right? So, one, shut the fuck up and start building, right? Start talking to people. Like, don't wait around. That's one. Two, oversharing. I mean, like, as we've seen time and time again, tell your stuff, tell everybody, right? You never know who's going to be your next best friend, right? The people you're sitting next to could potentially be your next funder, your next co-founder, or your next employee. So you guys should be going out there and talking to everybody. Don't be shy. Don't think your ideas are that special. Trust me, everybody has fucking ideas. No one cares about yours, right? You have to go out there and execute yours properly, right? So on the questions, um, you guys have been here for a couple of days, right? And you've been talking to you know, Lebanese entrepreneurs in the past. What are some of the things you think they should be focusing on more right now that's missing that they could easily fix? Any thoughts? Uh, I think uh, Bofak's point about uh, um, using crisis as uh, something to um, catalyst uh, the ecosystem is really interesting here. Uh, we spent this whole morning uh, in the Shatila uh, refugee camp, we went there to interview people to find out uh, what, what is the situation in, in, in Syria and, and Palestine and realizing of course that you are four million people and you have two million refugees here, uh, whereas in Finland we've let in 30,000 refugees now, and one of our Latvian friends said that in Latvia they've let in a grand total of 250 refugees uh, this year. So we realized that you guys have like 100 times more refugees than us, so it's a great potential and a great market. So if, if I were an entrepreneur here in uh, Beirut right now, I would spend 100% of my time figuring out uh, how to turn that into something interesting. Yeah, like, I mean, so like with Finland, right, they had the kind of the nugget of the game industry and they kind of built the rest of the industry around that. There could be a potential unique opportunity here and that could be kind of the, the little piece of sand that becomes a pearl, right? So, yeah, I mean, that is one opportunity here. Another opportunity is that it is in the middle of the Middle East. It's been, you know, Lebanese are, you know, very notorious for, you know, being everywhere in the world, being traders, being very entrepreneurial. You guys should own that. I mean, you guys should be taking that and, like, spreading that love everywhere in the region. Uh, Mofak, do you have any opinions besides what you kind of presented on thoughts that they could do here in Lebanon to kind of help grow faster from what you've seen in the last couple of days? I think that uh, what the government here is doing, or the central bank, the initiative to channel funding here is, is, is admirable. But I think you also need to look at the other... Uh, aspects of ecosystem building, and that is getting the grassroots involved, whether they're student-run initiatives or refugees or what have you, but something happening in the grassroots can be much more influential and valuable. Yeah, you guys have something really cool here. Like, uh, in the first 10 years of our startup scene, the government efforts uh, were basically just slowing things down, and it turns out that you don't seem to have a president or a parliament here. And I, I, I actually called my MP uh, yesterday and I suggested we do the same in Finland. Uh, he, he would lose his job, but he said it's a brilliant idea. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing how things still run. Yeah, you don't need to have a central kind of, you know, organization, right? Well, I mean, we're painting a very rosy picture about Finland. What are the things that you think you guys still could improve on? Is there anything that's like really, that you're kind of hitting up at the next level you want to kind of take to the next level, I would say? I think the, one of the paradoxes in Finland is that it's too big uh, of a market, so it's 5.5 billion inhabitants, but uh, you, can, you can easily create a company and spend years catering just for the Finnish market, make one or two million in, in revenues to employ 10, 20 people. If you take a country like Estonia, which is our neighboring country just in the south, they have 1.5 million people, I think. You're, you're big in Estonia from day one, so that, what that means is that Estonia has probably the highest number of startups per capita 
in the world, and they are international startups. Skype, uh, TransferWise, a whole bunch of others. They start something, they put some, hack something together, and they go to the global market. They don't lo have local VCs, so they go, they don't have a problem going to Sweden, Berlin, London, Silicon Valley, New York, Shanghai. And I, I think that is very important. You have to be very open to the outside world and not just be insular. That actually brings up a really good point. Um, so I'm in Silicon Valley, right? I don't see too many Lebanese entrepreneurs showing up. I mean, I know there might be visa issues and stuff like that, but I don't even hear about them contacting me through friends or anything like that. Versus like other countries, people are constantly reaching out, right? So I think that you know, your guys' next step is also, you know, this, is, this conference is one of the first things. Like, start telling the word more about who you guys are, right? And also supporting everybody. There's one Lebanese entrepreneur that's doing really well. Push him, you know, because that person will then help pick everybody else up. So I think it's really important to go out there and get outside of your own home country. You learn a lot more faster, and also you'll be able to get more resources around you as well, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've adopted in Finland the Silicon Valley intro culture. So if you go on Twitter right now and key in W-I-L-I, Willie, which is my name, uh, I'll connect back to you, and whenever you need any intros pretty much anywhere on the planet, uh, I'll be happy to do that, and uh, I'm pretty sure Paul can do the same. Yeah, this is actually, he just gave you guys a free nugget. You can email him, and he'll introduce you to people that he knows, right? Not email, Facebook. F whatever, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever the hell it is, right? But you could contact him, and he's willing to do that. He doesn't even know you guys, right? So you guys should be doing the same for each other, but uh, definitely take that offer. That's an awesome, awesome offer. I guess we're being booted off the stage. I want to talk more. What the hell? No, okay, that's great. Um, cool. You guys behind. Cool. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, there you go. So, no, you didn't hear the F bomb I just put there. Okay, guys, I'm so cool. sorry. Thank you, guys. If you want to finish your sentence, go ahead. I have nothing to say, guys. I'm done. I see you're like this. You're ready to say something. Go ahead. No? Fuck. Oh, there you go. Final word. <laughs>